Hello everyone and welcome to a special live edition of the Let's Run.com Track Talk podcast. Tonight we're privileged to be joined by a very special guest who will be familiar to any Let's Run.com visitor, Frank Shorter. Frank was the 1969 NCAA six mile champion at Yale University. He was a six time US champion on the track, but he's best known for his marathon exploits. He won the Fukuoka Marathon, then the unofficial World Championships, four straight years from 1971 to 74, and was ranked number one in the world by Track and Field News three years in a row. Most famously, he won the 1972 Olympic gold medal in Munich in the marathon, and this was after finishing fifth in the 10,000 earlier in those Olympics and breaking the American record in the prelims. Yes, prelims, they had them in those days in the 10K and the final. Pretty impressive stuff. Four years later, Frank earned the Olympic marathon silver in Montreal behind Valdemar Sarpinski, who many believe to have been part of East Germany's doping regime of the 1970s. Frank has maintained a commitment to clean sport throughout his life. He helped establish the US Anti-Doping Agency and served as its chairman from 2000 to 2003. And the 50 year anniversary of Frank's Olympic marathon win is this Saturday, September 10th. So that is why we are so thrilled to be able to talk to him tonight. Frank, thank you for joining us. And I guess first question, how are you celebrating the 50 year anniversary? Do you have any plans this weekend? Yes, very quietly. My wife and I, Michelle, were traveling to Pennsylvania and um, to a road race that's gonna be there north of Philadelphia in New Hope, um, Pennsylvania. And we'll just, she asked me earlier tonight what what we might want to do, and we'll just sit down and maybe watch, you know, get on, get on, you know, the internet and and watch the race and just kind of think about, um, you know, how it was. And there are other celebrations that have taken place. One was in Boulder, Colorado, on Memorial around Memorial Day, because I'm uh, in, involved in a race there called the Boulder Boulder. I helped to start it, and. Um, we had a celebration there for people in the Boulder community. And there's also going to be a celebration uh, in Florida, uh, in Gainesville, that the Florida Track Club is putting on uh, that's actually going to be in January around Martin Luther King weekend. So those are the kind of celebratory moments. And it just, and and again, um, we... Michelle and I never really thought about what we do on that day, but I think it's going to be a very quiet day and contemplative and we'll be thankful and, and thanking, thanking God that, that all this could take place. And, and I I think that's the way it should be because I like to think it fits in with um, how I thought about my chances uh, going into the Olympics, um, say two years before, and how that all just kind of came together in a way that um, who who could have imagined? And so I think it's again something where you don't. Uh, I I think I want to really understand um, how how it just in a way was meant to happen, and um, that I was so fortunate I got to be part of it. So I, I don't want it to be this sort of huge fanfare situation because, uh, you know, it was just the culmination of a lot of different things and the puzzle coming together in the perfect order. Um, and uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll just see. And we're just going to be happy and we're going to participate in the race the next day and uh, interact with people the way I did before all this happened in a way and since it happened. And so it, it, it just kind of, to my way of thinking, be continuity. So I want to ask about the race. Uh, you come in, you had won Fukuoka the year before, so that has to put you among the favorites. Like, do you think you considered yourself the favorite going in? And it seems like a couple of years earlier, you didn't think you could reach that point. So how did you think of your chances in 1972? And how did you think of your chances, I guess, a couple of years earlier? I this I'm getting back to what I I was just about which I was just talking. It just seemed the timing was right. Uh, the year before, I had never thought of running a marathon, 
Um, and in 1971, Kenny Moore talked me into running the Pan American Games Marathon Trial, which was a month before, in Eugene, a month before the track trials. And and his explanation to me was, well, this will be a hedge. We, you know, he said, and we run 20 miles together, you know, frequently because we would train together in Europe. We were over there, Steve Prefontaine and I, Steve never ran 20 miles, but we we would run 20 miles every Sunday. And he said, you know, and if you make the team, uh, you know, that takes pressure off on making the Pan Am team at 10,000 meters the next month, month later. So I, in a way, naively said, okay, I'll give it a try. And uh, we ran and we ran together and in the lead with, with a substantial lead to 22 miles. And the quote, that that has been attributed to me that is true because kenny used to love to sort of write down things we talk about i turned to kenny at 22 miles and i said kenny why couldn't Phidippides have died here and because that was my first experience going beyond 20 miles and i was at 22 miles so kenny ran on beat me well finished ahead of me by oh 45 seconds and i qualified for the Pan Am team. And then um, I realized, oh my gosh, I have to do this again. <laughs> and so I qualified for both the 10,000 uh, the month later and the marathon and won both races in Cali, Colombia uh, later that summer. And there were representatives from Fukuoka, the race that you mentioned, which was the de facto world championships. And they invited me to Fukuoka. And I decided at Fukuoka that since I was a track runner, uh, I would try to use track tactics in the marathon rather than simply what, it, uh, until that point, the marathon, I always uh, talked about it as a race of attrition. Everybody starts out, people slow down, the last person that doesn't slow down wins. And um, they, they didn't have breakaways. They didn't have um, surges the, the way they did in the track. And, and so in essence, um, in retrospect, I decided to turn the marathon into a track race to a certain degree. That first Fukuoka race, my second, my third marathon, I took off at about 15 miles at a hairpin turn. And Aki Usami, who at that time had won Fukuoka the year before and was the number one ranked marathon runner, tried to go with me. He couldn't. Everybody was left behind. I got a 30-second lead on him and actually maintained that lead for about eight miles to the finish. And so that's when the seed was planted. So I then, over the next year, actually adapted my um, interval training to practice surging in the middle of a race. And um, the, the whole theory was to get to a point where I could surge and then even if it went with me, I could slow down and I could recover more quickly to surge again. And um, it worked. It did. And, and so I even, and one more detail people want to no, well, we got to run. I started to run interval training, uh, basically um, focusing on what I felt, felt was my strength, which was my ability to surge at race pace faster to a faster pace than anyone could finish and then back off and be able to start surging again before other people could. And and that was just my theory. And, and um up to it and it worked i'm interested in your training because you did something that not a lot of marathoners do these days which is run the 10,000 and the marathon at the same olympics so when you're going into munich are you focused on one event more than the other or were you trying to train in a way that you could have success in both no i i train saying and and I guess there's a certain irony here in that I train like a 5,000 meter runner. My track workouts basically were 
5,000. The person who came close to running the track was Steve Prefontaine. And we used to actually run track workouts together. That Bill Dellinger would get him his workout, and I would have my workout based on I was my own coach by that time. And they were pretty much the same. So I, it was very fast paced. And, um, and again, I'm, again, if, I don't know how people train now, but I pretty much never ran any distance of interval training up to a mile at slower than 55 seconds per 400 meter pace. You know, 420 mile pace, even if I were doing repeat miles, I didn't run more slowly. And um, that was just what I did. And so I think, again, I had this sense that, that I, I wasn't fast in a sprint, but I was fast in an extended sort of effort. And that I also was finding out that I recovered very quickly between repeats. And so um, I'm not sure it was. Um, and, and again, you, you work with, and you work at that point in your career, and that's what I came to realize, I think, and I don't, again, know exactly how all the coaches and scientists, you know, talk about it today, but I really, I had a sense that once you reach a certain point in your training, you work on your strengths, not your weaknesses, because everyone is to a certain elite level, and then I think it's the person who can really focus on his or her strengths and and really develop those strengths. That's what can give them, you know. But I was lucky; I I got to coach myself, and and uh, you know now, as you said, nowadays people don't run the marathon, but we never thought about you know how much you needed to recover. Um, um, you know, you just ran a race and then you jogged slowly and then ran another race. Um, so yeah, I can understand why you would focus, but the other thing I enjoyed in Olympics and it's just, not the flying west, you know, <laughs> it has to be a model being my roommate in the 1970s in there in our room with this new white gun because they just got married and forged passes so every significant other could get in there and i'm sleeping on the balcony and dave wins and gold medal is up on the dresser you know i, I didn't have to wait um for all that time to run the marathon and we need something to do and i was always good at at repeating and it, 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 having short recovery again you know when you mentioned i won a six mile in the ncaa's in 1969 the next day i finished second in the three mile and it and i never thought about the fact that it was one day after the six mile and and so short answer to the question is i didn't know that. you were talking you were telling a story about dave waddle and i think that got almost all of that was broken up so i'm just asking you to repeat that if that's all right yeah, to, to when you ask about, uh, you know, why I would run the 10,000 meters and the marathon um, as well, even though there was a trial race in the 10,000 and a final and then the marathon, um, that was just my pattern. I grew up in high school running the mile at the beginning of the track meet and the two mile at the end of the track meet. You know, I was, I was used to running a lot, you know, in, in competition. And so, I also uh, just like the idea that why not run as many races as you can, because I think it 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 brings up a point um, about uh, my reasons for trying to put all this effort into the marathon to begin with. I I just wanted to find out how good I could be, and in a way, a corollary to that is I just wanted to find out how I would do if I ran all both races in the Olympics. 
it wasn't that, well, I'm going to try to win both. It was, okay, I'm a 10,000 meter runner. I'm new to the marathon. Let's see how I do in both. And it never in a way occurred to me that I was, you know, that the rest mattered. I was just finding out if I could do it in a way that satisfied my desire to find out about myself and what I could do. I hope that makes sense. You know, it, 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 because I'd never expected to run beyond college. And I just happened to get much better very quickly towards the end. And so, it, again, for me, it was a way, okay, let's find out. You know, you're improving so quickly. Let's find out where you level off. And so running both those races was part of that process of finding out where I would level off. And fortunately for me, I guess I didn't level off. I just, I just kept improving. And, and so, so I, I, I hope that sort of explains it. I've talked to, you know, a number of top athletes and, yeah, sometimes it's just as simple as they want to find out how good they can be. They want to test themselves. I know Safan Hassan tripling at the Olympics last year. It's just yeah. something she wanted to do. Uh, and the great ones have that in common. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm not so sure about the great, but I think it's a it's a personality trait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, you mentioned Dave Waddle. YouTube would the two Olympic gold medalists in sort of the distance events for America at those Olympics in Munich and you roommates, which is pretty astounding. Isn't that and great? <laughs> he, he won the gold medal the night before your 10,000 final. So right. what was that like? Were you able to sleep at all? Was he partying? How'd it go? That was fine. We didn't, you know, we weren't huge partiers. We just kind of, you know, congratulated each other and, and there weren't really banquet rooms. In, in the Olympic Village, and, and Dave and Jam went out and celebrated, and because uh, they had family there, and um, you know, I just went to bed. <laughs> um, and and it casual is not the word. It's I I think it's again compartmentalization maybe the word. You know, at that level, um, you know. Dave wins. He comes back and he says, okay, let's go. Jan, come on, let's go have dinner. And I don't know what they did and celebrated and everything else. And I told him how happy I was for him. And by the way, I was standing next to Jan when Dave was coming down that final straightaway um, because we had great tickets because we forged these passes for our significant others. And this particular pass allowed um, this bearer of the forge credential into any athlete section in any venue at the Olympic Games. So I'm standing and we're looking at this finish line in the 800 and she's standing next to me and we're literally 30, 30 yards away. And he comes around and he comes that last step and he passes ours and off. And, and I think we both realized I think he did it and I looked down at my arm and she had almost drawn blood in my arm with with her fingernails and so you know that's the kind of connection um you know that I remember it's not that kind of you know oh celebration oh we did it um because Dave was just so so subtle and so good and again, his timing was perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Legendary race. It always, I always see it pop up on, you know, YouTube or Twitter this time of year. And especially this year being the 50th anniversary. Uh, right. It's pretty cool to revisit. And if you check the results and, and I, again, I think his splits were 25, nine, 25, nine, 25, nine, 25, nine. He did not negative split. And the 800 is never, is, no, is always, almost always negative split, right? He ran even splits for every 200 meters <laughs> of that race. So he didn't catch people. Everybody came back. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 it, it it again it was the perfect timing and he knew and and um and I talked about working on your strengths he knew that was his strength he knew he didn't slow down like other people in the last 200 and so he was willing to you know take that risk and it turned out right for him so i wanted to ask you know obviously the 1972 Olympics were marred by the massacre that took place five days before your race. Palestinian terrorist group kidnapped and killed 11 Israeli athletes. You know, a tremendously sad, difficult situation for everyone at the time. And there's an article right now that's on the homepage of Let'sRun.com. You mentioned in an interview with Randy Manilov, the way you dealt with it was that you do that over which you have control. And what we had control of was our training. So. I'm curious in the days between the kidnapping and the massacre and the race, were you out there running? Were you able to leave the Olympic village to go for a run? How'd you prepare? Yeah. Well, we, we watched the TV because Steve Prefontaine was actually fluent in German because his mother was German and we realized what was going on. And, uh, once we got over the shock of what was happening and this is, Interesting, I think, um, that we all felt this is over. We're going home. That was the initial, you know, shock reaction. And now the psychologists have all the, you know, phases you go through. Um, but we were in shock. And um, again, you talk about having control. Well, we had control over our training. Yes. And so a lot of us I don't remember how many put on our stuff and jogged out to the back gate of the Olympic village. And, uh, there was just one gate and guards at the gate for the, we've been there two weeks and we got to know sort of all the guards. So we got jogged to the back gate and it was closed, right? It was locked, locked down. <laughs> and the guards had guns <laughs> and, and the same people we knew from before. And we sort of looked and we climbed the fence. <laughs> we just signed the fence in front of them. And, and they didn't know what to do because, again, no one knew what to do. It was the first terrorist act of its kind. And so we went over and we would go out and run and train. But there it really was stress relief. You know, it's what we could do to kind of deal with everything that was going on. And and I think the best thing you could do is maintain your team. And, 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 and you know, I think. Anyone who exercises knows that you use exercise, no matter what the motion is, to sort of let things process when you're going easily. So we did that. And so we went out and trained. And then I did, uh, and we then went to the memorial service the next day. So it was operating very quickly. And, but before I get into that, you know, that day we then come back from training and we're on the balcony looking out over the Olympic Village and we can see the, you know, the Israeli quarters and the guy with the mask and submachine gun. And um, that passes and then the helicopters flew right over our heads um, once they got to a point later in the day, early evening around dusk where uh, we see from the TV that they reached some sort of arrangement to take everyone out to the Munich airport. And the helicopters came in and we saw the helicopters leave. And I, I turned to Kenny Moore, you know, who was training partner and friend and uh, said, Kenny, I don't think it's over. And we learned the next morning that you know, they'd all been killed um, at the airport. And we had the memorial service and we didn't know what was going to happen there. So we walked over, uh, for, because it's only about a half mile from the Olympic village to the stadium. And we went and they had the service and it was announced that the Olympics would go on. And we then left, but we delayed by day and we left and walked out and started over some causeways over the roads. You didn't have to go down to road level to get into the stadium from 
the Olympic brand. And we started to walk down there and I, I, I turned to Kenny and I, and I said, you know, Kenny, the only place the terrorists can do anything here more is out on the Olympic marathon course. And I said, I'm not going to think about it because if I do, they win. And, um, that night and at that point, I just stopped thinking about it. And I woke up the day of the marathon, didn't think about it, ran the marathon, never thought about it, got done even that day and that night, never thought about it. And because again, you talk about, you do what you can over which you have some semblance of control. And, and I think, I don't think that's unique. Um, among the athletes um, at, you know, at the games, at, at the Munich games. Um, I think it's part of your training personality, I think, to be able to compartmentalize and focus. And um, so that's what we did. And so that was, um, that was how we dealt, how we dealt with it. So race day comes, you win the Olympic marathon, two twelve. 19, over two minutes ahead of the silver medalist Carol Lismont of Belgium. And you return to the United States and the the running boom in the, the years to come, it, the running starts taking off as a sport, participation sport in this country. And we, ha we have a question here actually from a Let's Run reader, uh, Bowbridge. He says, I'd like to know Frank's take on why he and Bill Rogers more or less jump-started the running boom in the USA back in the day. Do you guys just happen to be in the right place at the right time? Would there ever have been a running boom without you two guys? And why did your accomplishments catch the imagination of so many people? I got caught up in it in 1977, and I'm still running at 68 years old, as are many guys my age. So what do you think? I think, yes, Bill and I came around at the, at, um, at the right time. As a matter of fact, um, in, in the fall of 1966, Yale and Wesleyan had a practice cross country meet at Yale on the golf course where this is 1966, Bill, Bill was a freshman. I was a sophomore. Jeff Galloway was a junior and Abby Burfoot was a senior. So we ran together in 1966 and and so whenever people ask the question about, you know, the start of the running boom, you know, it was, it really was a group of, of people and there was something going on there. There, there just was, but it, it was obviously more than just one thing. And I think a big part of why it happened was um, my contribution. Um, I think in a big way was I just decided I didn't want to do um, what, was the usual um, thing or response after winning an Olympic gold medal. And in the U.S. at the time, and I, I don't think I'm being facetious here, you came home, you hired a PR agency, and you endorsed some products, and then you went on with the rest of your life. And I, one of the thoughts I had up on the victory stand when I was getting the medal was, I just want to let this settle in so I can really see uh, to, for myself, uh, where I want this to go and, or would like it to go. And so I came back, went back to law school. Um, and I think at the same time, uh, there was Bill <laughs> Rogers who watched me and the way I put it is he's, he's doing his work at a, at a hospital at the time and in, in Hartford and he's, you know, and we knew each other, as I said, and so the way I put it is he probably took one last big puff on the cigarette he was smoking and, and put it out and said, I can do that. <laughs> and he could. And, and so, you know, it, it, it sounds, it, it, I, I guess it's a, an interesting slant on serendipity, but it, it, it's kind of the way, you know, those things work. A lot of people around and certain people emerge. And then I think the other, th and, and the other part was that Bill and I were basically the same age. We're a month apart in age, but I, I matured in running er several years earlier than he did. And so his career went later. 
because I've always had a theory. You have about five years at the top if you're lucky. And when that five years comes is your place. And fortunately for the running boom, our careers overlapped. So for a while, I could actually finish ahead of them. <laughs> and then that went away. But the point is, we were first or second in the world uh, in the marathon for many years. Okay, there's that. But the other part of it was, I think the knowledge of health, exercise physiology was coming in. And it started really in the late 1960s. And one of the first um, uh, scientists, medical scientists to really study this was Ken Cooper in Dallas. This doctor from Oklahoma went down to Dallas and started the Cooper Institute and invented the term aerobics. And he started to quantify fitness. And so he, that was the first indication of you do this much exercise and, and accumulate this many points and your health will improve. You sort of set a minimum standard. And there were other tests from the 50s. Harvard had a test called the STEP test. Believe it or not, in the 50s, they were charting Harvard graduates to see, you know, over time as they were aging, how exercise would impact their longevity and health. So a lot of these things were coming um, together at the same time. But I, I do think Bill, in, in my contribution in many respects, was that we decided to stick around because we liked the, we loved to run and we wanted to keep running. And so then you had to figure out a way to earn a living. And we kind of dealt with that problem uh, in terms of opening up the sport to prize money. Well, first of all, I haven't said a word. I've been just listening for 30 minutes. So this is fascinating. But it's a small world. When I went to Yale, so I want to personally thank you. There would be no Let's Run I mean, there's this little community of runners solely because of you. Like, I, I at Yale, I was a kind of mediocre or decent runner at Yale, and I thought I could get better because they're like, oh, Frank Shorter used to do these runs. So I just dreamed of trying to do what Frank Shorter did. Now, I, I, I never came close, but I got fourth in the country at the 10K a couple of times and started Let's yeah. Run because I was, I was, I wanted to keep training like you. Like, I loved running. So I just want to thank you. And there's tons of people in Let's Run and in the comments here saying, like, Frank Shorter's the reason I did my first run and all this other stuff. So like, even though Munich was one year before I was born, it's, it's pretty cool to be here. And Ken Cooper's son was Tyler Cooper was on my high school team in Dallas. So yeah, you know, it's a very small world and very cool. Yeah. And, and that's it. You know, you're, you're just so thankful that you can be around and be part of it. And, and, um, it, and part of running is the friends you make doing it. And I, and I think part of the running boom came around and what I was trying to explain and not very well was that you can have people like Jack Batchelor and, and Jeff Talloway and John Parker, who I trained with, Steve Prefontaine and everyone else. And at the time, there was a spirit of cooperation and it wasn't it wasn't fake it wasn't contrived because at that time we had we wanted to support each other because in the same way you realize that on a team if you train together even though in the race you try to beat each other's brains out like Cree and I used to do um, we trained together and it you know that you both get better. And there was something like this going on with all of us who were trying to, in a way, survive so that we could keep running. And, and um, you know, that, that spirit, and, and again, I'm not being modeling here, but, you know, it, obviously things change and we have part of that. I mean, I was involved in opening up the sport to prize money and uh, I have some regrets about that. But I realized it was inevitable. And at the time I did it, it was totally against my self-interest because I was at the point where I wasn't going to win that much money, but I could still get appearance money. And uh, so, you know, you know we, we all sense this sort of, um, not communal, but effort of, of working together. And we truly appreciated each other. 
and it and admired each other's performances and 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 i think that has really a lot of that has to do with the fact that there just weren't there there weren't two huge entourages at that point you know it's just it was we runners and the good coaches you know like at greater boston and and you know out in actually the southern california striders and then you know the, the florida track club and 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 they we really liked each other i guess that's the way to put it <laughs> we didn't have any reason not to and 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 we all realized that this what we were trying to move forward on which was running and increase the interest and in, not so much the popularity but interest and there was a self-interest there the self-interest is more interest there is the longer i can keep going but but i think it was again a a, a different kind of um um uh, situation. It, it just wasn't all for profit, but it wasn't nonprofit. But, you know, we, we just wanted to um, uh, keep going because we just like to run. And that's when you talk about to get back to the running boom. I think what happened there was because of this sort of confluence of events and people and, you know, history and science and everything else. Yeah, people would start to run. And then there are certain people I hope it's okay to put it this way, but I think you're one of them. It's we find out we have this what I call a disease, but it's a good disease, and it's we just love moving across the ground running, and and um, and you you don't have to be an Olympic athlete to have that same feeling, and and I think that's that's really what happened. People d- discovered that well, yeah. I'm, this is popular, so I'm going to try something popular, and they say it's good for my health, so I'm going to do it for my health. And then there are certain people who try it and go, "I really like this, and it 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 suits me. It it allows me to deal with certain things, and you know, I just get this certain satisfaction. And I believe it's way beyond endorphins. And that that group just turned out to be a lot larger than any of us ever thought it would be. You mentioned something about when you were helping to open the sport up to prize money about regrets. Are those regrets you still have? Can you expand on what you meant by that? Well, the the regret is, you know, once the money got there, then there are also some ancillary people making that, that can make money off it too. Um, and, you know, you had the shoe companies and, and um, uh, agents and, and other people, and it just added more layers um, to the life. And, and I think that worked against uh, this sort of um, chim- uh, solidarity, that's not the right word, the, the, this feeling between all the running uh, enclaves in the country. The, the running enclaves were really fun because you could go from one to the other and everything be fine and and but then it got to the point where even one enclave, you would have problems within the enclave because of shoe companies and agents and other people. And so it did become more complicated, but that's the way life works. And so we knew that. So uh, it, it, I guess you, you're right to point out and, and make me realize it's not really a regret. It's, it's more, um, I had a feeling that might happen, but I realized that if the sport were going to continue, this was history, and I come along at a certain point, and then it's going to move on. It seems like it was inevitable, right? Like, you, right. You, you guys needed to make money, but then once you bring in money, stuff subtly changes. Because I think, I mean, I'm a runner, John's a runner. The running community, even the pro Olympic runners, they still have some of this camaraderie. But what you, de- what you describe, it's gone. It's it's not quite the same. It's still kind of there, but not. I don't know if it's the money or the agents. There's just a little more tension between people. And I don't. Maybe that was going to happen if we were going to have a professional sport. But sort of, I guess, looking back 50 years, I mean, it's a long time. We- Obviously, running as an activity has really taken off, but like running as a sport, Olympic sport, we've got another Olympics coming here in what six years now. Like, do you feel 
we had a rise in popularity, then a decline, or was it was running in a, as a spectator sport in, in its heyday in the seventies? Kind of how do you view running as a spectator sport versus an activity, and where we are the whole running boom? Yeah, I I don't think that I only think of that in terms of the drug testing and performance. So I'm I'm, I'm going to be honest and say you know my real focus is on truly trying to come as close to leveling the playing field as possible. And my reason for that is having been involved in the creation of U.S. anti-doping, and it's been more than 20 years now, U.S. anti-doping is still the template. If you want to deal with the drug problem, just mimics the wrong word, but just duplicate the U.S. anti-doping system totally independent, does all the testing, in charge of all the penalties, all the repeals, everything, right? And then if that were to ever happen, but I'm not sure it's going to happen very soon, um, but once that happens, then I can maybe focus more on, uh, you know, um, predicting. I guess knowing the situation with regard to performance-enhancing drugs now it makes me hard to predict, um, you know, what country might improve, how the U.S. might improve, because at this point, the the U.S. and and again, I guess that this is the way in which I I, I do regret this is, I think the fact any any nation, not just the U.S., but any nation that is truly trying truly trying to deal with this problem, is at a disadvantage because they're not getting the support from the top. And all you have to do is look and see what's going on with regard to you know, Russia and their athletes and everything else um, in, that, in that way um, until the people at the top decide it's really going to happen. It's not going to happen because, as I said, the IOC could very easily today mandate, say every country has to have a system that basically um, is the same as the U.S. system, it's set up the same way, with the same safeguards and and uh, eliminating conflict of interest. And um, um, and if they were to mandate that and enforce it, we uh, you know then then I could talk more. I think about what what the future of the race is, and you know a real irony here. And to give you an example, you say, well, I mean, can that really happen? The Balco raid, where Barry Bonds and others were implicated, no, it's years ago now, right? What, 2000? Oh, anyway. And at that time, there was an agent from, um, um, we, we had the USADA, had the IRS, and then... Um, some of the drug enforcement agencies, um, not drug enforcement, but, you know, FBI. And they were also on site. And the person who was there is now in charge of all drug testing for ultimate fighting. Jeff Nowitzki, right? And, and if you, what? Jeff Nowitzki. Yeah, Nowitzki. And so Novitsky was at the raid of Balco, what I understand. He then takes basically that concept to, you know, ultimate fighting and says, we are going to mimic U.S. anti-doping and anti U.S. anti-doping is going to do testing for us. And this is the sport that you see. They are constantly monitoring it and constantly penalizing people. And, 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 and ironically, I can say now that ultimate fighting in terms of drug control is probably the cleanest entity in the world. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's cleaner than track and field. And, and so, you know, when you look at that and you go, yeah, you can do it. If the people on top and ultimate fighting has to be commended for this, they said, Early on, we're going to deal with this problem. We're going to take care of it. That's crazy that fighting 
could be one of the cleaner sports because you know right stereotype like oh they're all dirty they're on all on steroids so big picture like the two olympic trials i did were 2000 2004 usada started in 2000 it was like a pioneering thing you were the chairman of it i mean drug testing was an absolute complete joke before then and now 20 years later i would say like in the united states it's much better but yeah how how clean do you think the sport is I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's pretty nuanced because it might be cleaner in certain places than others. But I mean, we've seen all these Kenyan busts and this sort of thing. And, and but just how do you view the sport now versus 20 years ago and, or 50 years ago? Oh, I think it's better than 20 years ago and 50 years ago, but it's still not good. And, and sort of my answer to that is I wish we could both talk to Travis Tiger, who's now in charge of U.S. anti-doping, to tell us off the record. You know, I would love, I would love to really know what he thinks. And I, I do communicate with him. But what I can also tell you is one of the reasons USADA really started the work was right from the start, we said, we don't tell anybody what we're doing. <laughs> As we're over doing, how are things going? Well, eh, eh. and, and if you're lucky, you get Travis writes the reasoned opinion and certain cyclist goes away, you know, and, and yeah, and you, you take those and you hope that, that, you know, those, those, those things can come shining through. And, you know, I want to be optimistic, but I don't want to be a Pollyanna uh, about it. And, and as long as the, I, I can say this, and I've said this all the time, as long as the IOC decides they don't really want to do anything about Russia, um, we're just going to have to wait and see if it can get any better. I'm curious, uh, do you have an opinion on the Shelby Houlihan case? Because obviously she's one of the most prominent distance runners in America. Her case is handled by WADA, not you. Oh, sorry, it's handled by um, the Athletics Integrity Unit and not by USADA. So are you familiar with the case? And do you feel like it would have been different if USADA had been in control do you buy what she's selling? I guess any any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, no, and and I think I answered the question before when I said, you know, I'd still maintain the way I used to talk publicly when I was working with USADA. You know, you just my my personal opinion on that is not um, on 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 how they're doing, on you know what individual in in the process is doing because, quite honestly, I've been out of the loop for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and so I can, and I, and I hope you realize I'm not begging off here. I wish I, I wish I knew more, but I also understand that it, it makes me feel good knowing that I don't know more and, and that it, it still has to be, um, uh, uncertain. And, um, I don't, you know, I don't have access to, you know, the exact, um, test results. And again, you, again, I, I'd refer over to U.S. Anti-Doping and ask them what they feel their um, opinion is. But the other thing is the Athletes Integrity Unit uh, is uh, raising some eyebrows. And again, it has this same um, feeling that you, USADA has had, which is they are truly independent. And, and they're not answerable and they don't feel pressure from anyone. And so to my way of thinking, you know, the more, the better. Hey, I wanted to ask, this is something, this is an issue in doping that has affected your career because 1976, you finished second behind Sapinski, who, you know, his name has shown up in some of these Stasi files that he might be affiliated with the state sponsored doping regime. Like, at the time, did you when you finished second in that race? Do you suspect anything of him? Did you know he might have been doping at the time? Oh yeah, I I walked up to him, and he was wearing a white singlet, and he didn't have the East German crest on it. You know the logo medallion, and I thought it, it, here's here's how my eye in terms of evaluating running and commentary, I thought he was Carlos Lopez. I ran the whole Olympic marathon in 76 thinking Cherpinski was Carlos Lopez because I had done, I had broken my ankle the 
February before the games and decided, even though I won the Olympic trials, I wasn't going to run the 10K. So I was doing commentary with Eric Siegel in, uh, in, in the stands in the 10,000 in 76 and where Lopez finished second. And I said, and I think it was on air, I said, that guy, that guy would make a good marathon runner just from watching the way he ran. So I was just, what, eight years ahead of, ahead of, ahead of schedule. <laughs> and, and I didn't know who he was because I hadn't seen him. And if you look at the records until the year before, his best was something like 215. Um, and so there was, and, and he'd run, I guess, 212 in the East Sherman trials, but we hadn't really received any word of that. So I, I didn't, you know, I, I, no, he, he wasn't on my radar. So I ran the whole race and, and, and I finished and he ran a lap extra, you know, do you remember that? He, he didn't even know how you were supposed to finish. You come into the stadium, you run down the final straightaway, and then you do another lap and finish. Well, he ran down the final straightaway um, and did two laps. <laughs> and, Trying to make it fair. Yeah, I guess. And so I was waiting for him at the finish. When he came by, the second lap. And so I shook his hand, and, and he said to me, Reckon sie Deutsch. <laughs> and I thought that's very that that is very unusual for someone from <laughs> you know Portugal to say. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the Olympic marathon. So so I um and then when I found out he was from East Germany, yeah, I knew. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? You know, we're 46 years on now. How are your feelings on him and on that, that race? Well, I've been saying this for many years now, again, and it has to do with the drug situation. It all comes from the top on down. The IOC wants to do anything about it. They can't. But the history, uh, if you look back, you had a president of East Germany uh, who was eventually given the Order of Olympic Merit by Juan Antonio Samranch, who was um, Franco's last surviving cabinet member. You had a fascist and a communist. And the fascist gave the communist the Order of Olympic Merit. What does that say about power? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, um, he also, Samran, put the head of the East German drug program on the U.S. Olympic um, International IOC Drug Committee. So they knew all the testing that was going on, and that allowed them to have parallel labs at meets. And so to think that the IOC now could say, well, we want to rectify that wrong. You, you have sort of uh, impeding that, the fact that a former president of the IOC, head of the IOC, right, had had this relationship with the East German president. It sounds crazy, but... but I mean, I'm like, wow, it was a different era back then. And then, oh, wait, Lamine Diak, who was the head of World Athletics, you know, what? How many years ago, John? Five? Seven? Seven, yeah. Covering up tests. It's crazy. Because I remember people saying, I mean, we're always hearing it. This Everyone thinks everybody's dirty. And I'm like, but some guy went to this huge conspiracy once. And I'm like, that that's impossible. For that to be happening, they'd have to be covering up a test at the top. Well... <laughs> turns out it was happening so maybe stuff hasn't changed that much but i i'm just trying to be realistic uh about it you know yeah and given my experience because you know i also had good experience during dealing with international track and field with regard to you know the trust fund and 
everything else that that's you know involved with that and and the testing um so you know we'll we'll see not so much the testing but you know olin castle who was head of the um um U.S. track and field for years and was kind of considered a villain, actually worked very, he, he really was an ally for us when we were working back then. And I think that should be pointed out. Um, he is the guy that, that really took our case overseas so that we could open up the sport. And I think he's, he was cast as a villain and that really wasn't, that really wasn't the case. It, you know, it's very easy to do that. And it was someone who, is so good about not giving me information again, like Travis Tiger, you know, it's sort of like, you know, and, and, and so I just, again, I just, that just came to my mind for all you listeners that, you know, don't believe everything you see in, in the movies, even though a lot of it was true. There, there are some aspects of it that aren't. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about times. Your personal best is 210.30 from Fukuoka in 1972. Now, for context on how good that is, last year in 2021, only one American ran faster than that time, 49 years later. So that would still put you among the best U.S. marathoners 49 years later. I, I guess I wanted to start by saying, did you ever run in a marathon in your career that either had a pacemaker or that had where time was sort of something you were going for rather than place. No, never had a pacemaker. And, and again, the way I ran, I always searched and then ran negative split. I mean, positive splits, you know, I, I, I would run two two eleven in Fukuoka when I won, but I went out in one Oh three and, and there was no one else around. And, and so that's the way I ran. And so, um, but I don't even, so, but again, I don't predict, I don't predict how much faster I could have run if I had even pace or ran even pace or had a pacer because that's not the way it was. And, and I think for me, it served me well, because I think from what we've talked about today and your listeners, they can see, I, I was, I was good at varying pace. I wasn't an even pace runner. That's mm -hmm. not what I did because I knew. And, and this is, I think, something I always tried to tell the younger runners and the coaches and stuff at that level, even in the marathon, but most in the track races, for sure. Everyone knows how fast everyone else in that field is on the continuum of finishing speed. You know that if everybody's together with 165 to go, you have a pretty good idea who's going to win. And so all those people who aren't the fastest have to figure out another way. Are you catching my drift? And it, 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 it and so I, and I, again, to sort of come back and summarize again, I worked to my strengths and, and my strength was in essence to, and I'd never really thought about it this way before. My strength was slowing down the overall speed of the race by using speed in the middle of the race. Yeah, I feel like that's something that you don't see as much. These, I mean, with the pacemaker, certainly not with the pacemakers, but right. with them in the race, because no one's going to surge ahead of the pacemakers until they drop out about 30 kilometers, you know? Right. And so you, right. that strategy, you might be able to put pull it off in a Boston or New York, but a lot of the big city marathons, it's hard to implement these days. Right. And I'm saying I, I'm willing to acknowledge that I was very fortunate to say, come along when I did. So is it foolish then to ask you what you, I know you said you don't really make predictions. Is it foolish to ask you what you think you could have run? You, we put you in Berlin marathon, perfect pacemakers. No super shoes because I, I couldn't have stood it. I wouldn't have done it. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't. <laughs> it's, it's not my nature. Um, and, you know, my form, um, part of what helped me was I was very light on my feet. And, and so um, who knows how much I would have benefited from the platform shoes, right? The rebounding shoes. 
I don't know. You don't know. And, and um, no, but um, I don't mind. <laughs> it's, it, it, you know, I, and again, I have found, even though, and, and this is what I want to help in, you know, the summary of what we're talking about here. I'm still a huge fan and of running. And when you talk about, you know, being able to forget about terrorists and stuff, I watch races now and I don't think about the rebound. You know, I think about the tactics. And, and so it, it's still in me to know in a way more than I should of what's going on, but I can still appreciate what's going on because I realize that's, that's the level of the sport. That's what's going on at this point in time. Now, the other thing I would like to say, and, and again, this is um, uh, just a personal opinion, there are other sports, one in particular that has done a much better job of this kind of situation with the shoes, and that's swimming. Think of how they handled the suits, right? Yeah, they, they basically put a unilateral ban back in right, 2009, right? 2010. Right. And it could be done. And, and it's also, you know, with the, the, the people, the blade runs, you know, you can, you, you can adjust those blades and, and limit them. And so who knows, maybe they could do something along those lines. But again, I think I'm getting in over my head here, but, um, you know, you can, if, if you want to give it a try, but swimming is the best example of, okay. No, we're just cleaning this up. Yeah, I think the genie's out of the bottle. I don't think they're going back. But my biggest complaint with the whole shoe thing was it was unfair. Like at the, at the what was it, 2016 Olympics, some of the Nike runners had new shoes. Nobody else did. And then everyone's playing catch up. I mean, I guess if it's a level playing field now, like the other companies have had time to make their shoes. But to me, it's like doping. If some people can dope and others can't, it's not fair. Forget the health aspects. Well, I agree with that. I mean, if if you're going to, at certain championship levels, you have just to guarantee that everybody, anyone who can't afford the shoes can have them. Yeah. And then also, yeah, like you said, like one of the greatest things with running is sort of how universal it is. And like anyone can get a pair of shoes and race. And so now like kids are going to have to drop. Yeah, now, now anyone with $300 can get a pair of shoes. Yeah, now it's 300 you know. <laughs> I don't know what sh shoes cost, you know, when you're running, but for me, they, they used to be under a hundred bucks. That was like considered That's right. That's not right. too bad. Yep. Well, kind of changing subjects here. You mentioned don't, uh, you know, believe everything. I think you said it, you see in the movies and there's a guy here in the comment section. He said, is Frank ready to see my tattoo of he and pre at Hayward on my arm? <laughs> oh my gosh. He's got a grown man has a has a tattoo of you and Prefontaine on his arm, but I, and I I I'm pretty sure which one it is. It's where we're sitting uh, on the infield, and I have this odd looking turtleneck on, and it's before we ran. Um, it may have been his last race, and um, we were just talking. And the story there is for people who don't know. You know, Steve was organizing this meet in defiance of the U.S. Federation and invited all the Finnish track runners to be in it. And I got back from an interval workout on the Tuesday before the Friday meet, and I and I'm and I just back from the track, and I get a call in my kitchen, and it's Steve, and he'd just been out training with me in Colorado, because people, a lot of people don't know that he he realized that that I had come on to I, I had discovered something in the altitude training. So he came out and trained with me for a month. And um, I even took him down to Towski Valley and we ran at 10,000 feet and, um, and everything. And then, so he went home uh, and then organized this meet. And he, the Tuesday before the meet, like I said, my hardest interval workout on Tuesday, I get a call and he says, hey, Frank, come out, you can come out here and run the 5K against me uh, this Friday because Viren's dropped out. And, and the words out of my mouth were, oh, you need somebody to be, <laughs> or at least be close. And, and he said, yeah. 
so so I flew I flew out there and we ran the we ran that 5k and I think that's that may be the picture we were just together on the infield before the race and and um you know after he took me home well where I was staying at Kenny Moore's and drove down the hill and was gone so that that um uh, yeah that was um uh, quite a day yeah and most i mean there's a couple of generations that only know pre really from the movies yeah so so sort of i don't know what reflections do you have of him that you want people to know or that we don't know or that the movies get wrong no it's not that they get it wrong i mean you know there's i'm i'm willing to well, i mean how can i criticize it when kenny moore wrote you know the screenplay that's true <laughs> and and, and, and by the way, for your listeners who don't know, Kenny, who was a great friend of Freeze and mine, died May 4th. And um, and he was fourth in the Olympic marathon. Yeah, great runner and great writer. And wonderful writer. Wonderful writer. And, and um, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, um, and, but, but what I would like, you know, the people that know about Pre that that he was going to change he he learned his lesson in the 5072 i was one of the few people that could tell him that he'd been stupid <laughs> one in predicting and telling people how fast he could run the last four you know last 1600 meters um me and stewart had the best comment to that which was when he sort of announced that's what he was going to do and me and stewart said well Hell, five of us can do that. <laughs> and 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 then running wide the entire last lap. I could tell him that. But he and but uh we were gonna train together next year. So I just thought people might like to know that again, because um what I was trying to say at the start, I mean, it really was that's that's the way we were then. And he and I would train. And we do intervals together. And he liked to do intervals with me because I, I truly share the lead. Every, you know, you're running 12, 400 meters. I led six, he led six. And he would train with me because I shared the lead. And so, you know, again, that was just the way we did it. And then the race would come. We try to beat each other's brains out. And then we go back train together. Would he have won in 76? I don't know. I don't predict like that. He, he would have been in there though. He was getting better. Mm -hmm. And, and if you want, do you want one more pre anecdote? Of course. And I've done this publicly with people when, when he came to train with me that, that, you know, in that month before he died, it took him down to Taos to the ski Valley, which is at, um, the base at 9,000 feet and he had never skied. And, um, we went on the beginner's hill. And I, we got him equipment and it was a very short kind of chair lift with this tiny beginner's hill about, you know, 150 yards long, 200 yards maybe. And so at the bottom, I'm showing him how to snow plow for the skiers, you know, and then how to apply pressure to start a snow plow turn, you know, going left and right and put pressure on the left ski and you go to the right and you put pressure on. And then, so we go up the chair and he gets off and he starts to snow plow and he doesn't even attempt to turn. And he goes right down the hill and crashes into the hay bales at the bottom of the beginner. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I've killed him. <laughs> and and, and by, by, the, by the time we left, we were up on the mountain, we were skiing. But we also, at 11 o'clock, we stopped skiing and we'd run four miles down from 9,000 feet to about 8,000 feet and four miles back up. And then after skiing, we would run up to 10,000 feet and do another six or seven miles at 10,000 feet. And that was our ski vacation. One time, starting down the mountain, it started, it was spring, it was early April. And it started for people familiar with snow. It started the corn snow, 
cornstone just looks just like cakes. And it, it's because, you know, it's right on the melting point, 32 degrees snow. And the wind was coming up the valley as we were heading down this like 70% grade, this road. And the corn snow was blowing horizontally and hitting us, you know, right in the chest. And we had to actually struggle to run down this hill, right? And what people, <laughs> Steve was a pisser and moaner. He loved to piss and moan when he ran. And he was, you know, we all knew that. And I knew that. So we start down, <laughs> running down the hill in this course, no blowing, freeze, freezing, hitting us and melting as it hits us. And I turned to him as it just started to, just the ramp was getting out of control. And I said, Steve, do you know? No one in the world is probably training harder than we are right now. And for the first time ever, he shut up. And we ran the rest of the workout. He never said a word. And we ran. We ran. So that's my prefontaine story. And back then, a lot of people didn't do altitude training, right? Did you just sort of discover that on the own? Or was yes. the science getting out there about it? Or how did that come about? My family had moved to Taos, New Mexico in 1967 when I was a junior in college. And Taos is at 7,000 feet. And I realized when I went back for my junior year that um, it, it was better. I, I could tell. There was an effect. And then it, it really took hold when I went out the next summer and trained at altitude. And then went back and had that. That's when things began to take off for me. Um, in, in college, you know, in, in the sequence is I, I, um, you know, ran very well in the Ivy league and, and then finished 19th in, in the national cross country, which was all American. And then in the indoor track meet at Joe Lewis, I was second in the two mile. And then I won the six mile outdoors and the three miles outdoors that senior year. So you can see it was a big leap and, but it was, it was happening. And I think it was because of the base training that, that, that I found I could do, I could do at altitude. Yeah. So it, it, in a way I didn't discover it. It, discovered me. <laughs> it sounds like the altitude really paid off for you. I mean, with my own oh, running, yeah. Oh, yeah. same thing. I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona for four months and I became like, I ended up staying four years because I became so much a better runner. And yeah. Well, also, so, Frank, this is a personal thing. One of my lifelong goals, I want to see Yale win the Heps cross country. They, ha they haven't won since the war, and that's World War II for anyone out there. Do you, do you have any advice? Like, or maybe the whole team should move to, al move to altitude for the summer and come back. Like, Oh, no, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It, it, uh, again, you just you hope for the cycles. Um, We've been hoping for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And... And just on the on the yell note, I started running a, a relay called Hood to Coast about 12 years ago. And a bunch of old Yale guys from my cross country team were like five of us were on that first 12 man relay in our 60s uh, from Mount Hood to Seaside, Oregon, 200 miles. And so, yes, we, we, we need that spirit at Yale again. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it, it would be. No, I don't say we need it. It would be nice to have it. You know, where um, one of the guys, um, and, and here's a factoid, is, is um, his name is Dan Larson. When he was a freshman at Yale, he decided to run the Boston Marathon. And he is one of, I think, three people who have run more than 50 Boston Marathons. And he's on our relay. And he was on that relay this year at 70 or 69. So, you know, Yale can produce the runners. It's just... Sometimes there's a long time in between. <laughs> yeah, got, I, yeah, for sure. I got one question related to your running now, one more Yale question. First, how much do you run these days? I run, I jog, walk um, four times a week. And then I'll walk another two times. And then I will cycle indoors and sometimes outdoors. And then I do... Uh, a lot of weight training, especially core training. And I also do 
water therapy for balance. So in a way, I'm spending <laughs> just as much or maybe more time training, if you want to call it that, than I did when I was running 20 miles a day. You're doing this for your health or just because you like being active? Or Well, I, I taught, yeah, no, but I also think, and I sent you the same, I think certain people have what I call an exercise quota and they need to do a certain amount of activity in a day. And, and, and it, because it feels good, it's not an obligation. It's part of your routine. And when we were at Yale, we did it for stress relief. I'm, I'm, I know that's a big part of it and, um, still do it. You know, it, and it allows you, you can either focus on what you're doing or think about anything you want to and drift off. And it's, it's, it's a time when you're working out that you can sort of consolidate a lot of things like thoughts, or you can just drift off to wherever you want to be. And I think um, just certain people need to do that on a daily basis. And I'm one of them. Yeah, I think, I mean, exercise, running, it makes us better people. So yeah, for sure. And uh, my Yale question, we, we touched on this before we got in here. I'd always heard this story. And it just shows that Frank Shorter, the great Olympic champion, is human. So I don't know what, I think he, it was a Yale-Harvard meet. Yale had never beaten Harvard in a long time. Outdoor, it's, outdoor it, dual meet. Outdoor dual meet, two miles. Like if you'd get a certain place, I think Yale could win the meet and you drop out with 800 meters to go. Tell us the story for the record. Okay, for the record. And I, again, I said, I'd like to research to see if I ran the mile in that race too, because very often I would double. Um, it was the spring of my junior year. I was a pre-med psychology major. And the course of that year for most pre-meds is organic chemistry, which is one of the hardest courses at Yale. It was at the time. And the lab was a very, very hard lab. You had many unknowns. I won't, won't go into numbers. And I was trying to finish because the, the track meet was towards the end of the year before finals, but it was towards the end. And I was trying to finish up uh, all my lab work uh, by identifying these unknown um, elements. And um, I had my roommate, Ken Davis, later on. And for, again, the Yale people, um, I always maintained I was the underachiever in the room because right now Ken Davis is head of all Mount Sinai medicine in the United States. <laughs> and, and so um, he was a sprinter and he hadn't, and he was my roommate and he hadn't seen me for days. Well, I was out at the labs trying to find the unknown. And, and so I, literally show up at the meet and Ken doesn't even know whether or not I'm going to be there. And Gegengak, the coach didn't, wasn't, didn't know if I was going to be there. So I show up and in half a mile going to two mile and I'll, I was on pace to run like nine, 10 or nine, 11 for the two miles. And I, I probably wouldn't have won, but I was probably going to place. And I just dropped out. I went to the infield. I laid down on my back. Ken Davis comes running up to me with Gegengat. And they both there together. And the and Ken reminded me years later, I forgot about this. Years later, he said the first words out of my mouth were, it's camphor. It was my last unknown. I was delirious. <laughs> and, and, um, and, that's one of the um, two times I think I've ever dropped out of the race, and the other time was injured. And um, so it happened to be in the middle of the Harvard deal. Track me. And Yale yeah, lost the meet, and Harvard won the meet. Yeah, the longtime coach Mark Young would would tell me that because we, we won one year, and he was trying to pump me up. He's like, Frank Shorter didn't do that, and I'm like. Well, he did win the Olympic marathon, so I yeah, we, well, tra we, tr we trade spots. Yeah, I know. I know. Anyway, but uh, 
And thank you for doing this. There's a question here in the chat. How fast could you run a mile right now? Oh, geez. I don't know. And, and I don't want to know. No, I'm serious. I, I don't want to know. I'm going to be 75 years old in a month. And um, uh, no, as long as I can keep going. And I've been this way for over 20 years. When the first um, GPS watches came out, I was at a trade show and someone at one of the booths said, here, here, we want to have, have, want to have one of these. And I turned down the watch. And I said to him, I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> because so much of my running, and I think what helped me was that when I went easy, I went easy. And that's what Jack Batchelor reaffirmed. And, and actually, he probably taught me that down in Florida. And I just run easily, man. I, I, I just, I, if, if. I would time myself for a mile if I were doing interval training now, which I'm not, and I wanted to run a race, which I'm, I don't want to. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just being honest and sure. I'm willing to admit that, you know, it's kind of hard to realize you're slowing down. Um, <laughs> I don't have to hit myself over the head with it every day. And, and so, um, that's, that's the answer I got. Yeah, I'm not even 50, and I feel the same way. I, I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> a couple quick ones here before we let you go, Frank. I wanted to sure. know fr from the readers. Uh, we've got a question from Runners Runner. Who would you consider the tough, the toughest non-American athlete you ever raced against? Brendan, Brendan Foster. Um. 10,000 meter runner, um, just, you know, just a gutsy Northern Britain blue collar runner and mm -hmm. great, great competitor. Uh, and we, we had really good races. Um, and, um, <laughs> one year, I think it was 1975. We raced in Crystal Palace, London, and we actually ran, I think, um, the fastest time of the year, and it may have been when I set my PR. Um, and I took out that race and ran, I think, under uh, like 13.55 for the first 5K, which was pretty fast for those days. And I had, uh, and he took over with about three quarters of a mile to go. And got about a 30 mile, uh, 30 yard lead on me uh, coming into the final straightaway. No, 20 yards. And down the straightaway, I was happy. But I realized about 50 yards from the finish line, I wasn't going to catch him. And this is something I always tell people too about reframing. I started to reframe at that point, saying, I'm going to, how I was going to changed my training so next year I was going to catch him or next time I was going to catch him and so I caught him two yards beyond the finish <laughs> and we're walking along and we're friends and, and I'm going jeez Brendan I almost caught you and Brendan in his great understated way looked at me and said Frank I beat you <laughs> <laughs> And, and and we were ranked one two in the world that year, on that race. <laughs> oh wow! He's a tough man. Yeah, oh, it's a great great commentator for a long time as well for the BBC. Um, yeah. Okay, another question here from uh, Run Bum. You were self coached since your college days and used the same system throughout your career. Do you think this system took you to your physical potential or would you change anything if you could redo it? And he also wants to know, could you give us a sample week of training for you during your prime? Oh, okay. Um, no, I, I, I wouldn't change it because I, I do think, you know, I just happened to make some good choices and, and I kind of knew what my abilities were. One, light on my feet. Two, I could recover. 
um, and not only during workouts, but between workouts. And, and, and I realized the speed training worked for me. Um, and a typical week when I was running well uh, would have been 20 miles on Sunday. Sometimes I ran um, hard, sometimes easy. We had a group that met at my house every morning in Boulder, and we would run 20 miles. And we would run the first 10 e easily, probably over six-minute pace, 6, 6.30, who knows. And then we would run. Everyone could take off on the second two-mile loop. It was two-mile, two 10-mile two, two loops. And, and it was how fast you could finish that second loop. And um, I came even at altitude for that second 10 miles. I could, I could um, um, be a little bit over 50 minutes for the second 10, 51, 2, 3. Then Monday, Monday, and this is where the recovery came in. And that's why this is a good question. Monday, I ran my most difficult interval workout of the week, the day after the 20 mile run. And I would run six or seven miles in the morning. In the afternoon at altitude, it would be intervals that would total three miles worth of hard running. And then the rest in between was about half the, uh, double the distance I would jog at sea level, but I would try to run my sea level time at altitude, which was 65 seconds. So I never ran 1,200 meters at altitude slower than 315, ever. And I would recover in between. Then I would take um, an easy day the next day and run. At altitude, I would run, uh, I averaged about three to four miles less than at sea level. At sea level, I could do about 20 miles a day. At altitude, I found 17. It just turned out to be the, the number, okay? And I think that had something to do with recovery. And on the easy runs, I never timed um, my easy runs. Jack taught me that. Uh, because the whole point was to recover. And my theory was that by jogging, the, the, the easy days are to recover through venous pressure muscle contraction. It's not really a training run. It's a recovery run. And if you're jogging, it makes sense. It makes sense to me that, you know, you're contracting muscles um, uh, faster and better and it'll speed up your circulation. I don't know if that's, I don't even know if they've proven that now, but that's what I believed. Then on the Thursday, I would do something like 12 times 400 meters with a very, very short recovery in the afternoon. Um, and then, uh, but on the Thursday, if I were racing, uh, so I might have taken two easy days sometimes. And then if I weren't racing on a Saturday, on Saturday, I would run um, in and out 200, 200s and try to average under 28 seconds. Uh, for the 200s, just for speed. I'd run 20 of them. And so that was about it. And then if I raced, I, I, I would race. And then every once in a while on the, say, the Thursday uh, uh, run before, or let's see, uh, on the Wednesday run where I was going easily, I would start my second workout of the day, and, and I always started it out in the same route and it, to warm up. And because if I were feeling really good on that day, I would um, do, it turns out, what was now, it was now called the tempo run, which is, you know, lactate threshold right on. I didn't know that's what it was but I would warm up for about 10 minutes if I felt really good. And then I had a certain course I would always run when I felt like that. And it ended up running uh, around the University of Colorado uh, bike path, which circles the campus. And I would always end up on that bike path and see how far along on the bike path I could go in 40 minutes total of hard running and finish. And that's how I gauged my improvement. 
because as I got better and better, I finished farther and farther along the path. And that, that was essentially it. And the other thing about it is I train that way all year round. I ran on the indoor track uh, at, at Colorado and did the same kind of intervals. So I ran as hard indoors as outdoors. And again, I, I got to the point where I never ran 400 meters at a pace slower than 65 seconds. So that, and I did it year round. That's what I did. Thanks for sharing that, Frank, to hear the, the training uh, week. I think that was pretty, that was pretty cool for me. Certainly one of the more interesting parts of the, the interview. Well, then, do we have anything else for him? It's been about, I think, 90 minutes. So I don't want to keep, I, I could talk to you for like another two hours and hear your stories from, you know, 50 years ago, Frank, but I don't want to be too, uh, you know, overbearing. We're kindred spirits here, like I said. So we, we, you know, and, and I like talking to other runners in a way that's not the usual way that runners talk to each other, which is about uh, training and injuries and most recent performances. So yeah. and more, more theoretical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, it's been 50 years. Like what's maybe two questions. When you look, this is the question from Adam uh, stank on the chat. When you look back at the 1972 Olympics, what do you remember the most? It, what, I, it was, well, I can only free associate here and say, what do I think about the most? And, and it really was the massacre and that what went on after it. You see what I mean? That, that moment when it happened, um, um, I, and when you ask me how often I think about, um, you know, the race, I think about the massacre more than I think about the race and, and, and that whole, um, situation, you know, and the whole just horror, horror of it. And one thing I'd like to say that I don't think many people of, of which many people maybe are not aware, the Boston bombing. I was across the street at in front of the Lord and Taylor store when bomb one went off at the finish line. I was on my way to a, a an NBC uh, production meeting in the afternoon, and I started to go into the um, Lord and Taylor store, which was the store that had the camera on top that had the video of bomber number two, and bomb two went off right behind me across the street as I was entering the vestibule, um, Lord and Taylor. And so I think I'm probably one of the few people who is, who heard the shots in Munich and the bombs in Boston. So, and, uh, so it, it, it's, it's always a reminder to me of, um, you know, how there can be so much good and so much bad in the same place. So anyway. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot bigger things out there than running. And as I think people born after 72, we don't appreciate that, you know, that's the same Olympics because, well, we hear about the the massacre and we hear about, oh, Frank Shorter won the Olympic gold medal and we don't realize these were five days apart. I mean, it's just sort of, but I think some of that's life, right? There's, there's evil, there's good, there's love, there's, yeah, they could be at the exact same place at the exact same time, pretty much. Yeah, and and you're right. That's a very good way to put it. I'll cite I'll cite you if I ever say that. <laughs> also, the other thing. So, fifty years, you have all this perspective. What's the number one piece of running advice or life advice you'd give people out there? Oh, I don't know about life advice. I wouldn't be any good at that. Um, um, yeah, the running advice is, and I've always said this: consistency is the key. The more consistent you can be in your training, the less you have to get it exactly right. And not only does it give you more leeway, it allows you to refine your training. So it, 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 it helps you in two ways. You, you, you can have, you, you, you don't need to be as 
precise and good, and yet it, it'll help you get better at it. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. It does. Absolutely. I mean, look at, you know, I know a lot of the breakthroughs we see from athletes is just, hey, I was able to get three years of healthy training uninterrupted. And they just naturally, if you're doing that in your 20s, you're going to improve. And if you're talented enough, you're going to get that breakthrough, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else for Frank? Uh, I mean, this was a, this was a pleasure really uh, to, to hear you share your wisdom, to reminisce about Munich 50 years on. It was, it was, uh, I, I know that our listeners in the chat appreciate it. I know that everyone who listens to this in the podcast later is going to be appreciative. Um, we just wanted to say, you know, thank you for, for joining us tonight, Frank. Good. Thank you. Anytime. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for inspiring us all. Thanks. And, and have a celebratory drink or something on Saturday for sure. Oh, okay. And stay safe, everyone. Stay safe and be happy. Thanks. You too, Frank. Bye-bye. Thank you.